participants today. My name is Javier Mancero. I am chief of the Social Statistics Unit in the Statistics Division of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. I am pleased to welcome you to this webinar on poverty mapping using small area estimation techniques, jointly organized by the Intersecretariat Working Group on Household Surveys and the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. We have a large attendance today, we're around 170 people from different parts of the world, and we are glad to have all you here joining us in this webinar. The program for today includes seven presentations by distinguished, distinguished experts in the implementation of methodologies for small area estimation, and with a particular focus on the use of these methodologies for the disaggregation and mapping of poverty indicators. We are very grateful to our speakers for taking the time to participate and share their experiences with, our, with us. Before starting, a few housekeeping topics. Today's event has simultaneous translation. You can find it on Zoom in the button interpretation. Um, the webinar is being recorded and the video in its original language and the presentations will be made available on the web page of the event. We will not have a dedicated section for questions and answers, but if you have questions, please submit them in the chat and our speakers will do their best to answer them uh, through the chat. Um, so let's get, uh, get started. For the opening words uh, of this event, I am pleased to give the floor to Francesca Perucci, Assistant Director of the UN Statistics Division, and Rolando Campo, Director of the Statistics Division of UNECLA. Please, Fran Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Javier, and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's, it is really my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this webinar today on, on poverty mapping using small areas estimation methods. As Javier said, uh, uh, we have a great uh, audience here today. We have colleagues from uh, national statistical offices, other government institutions, uh, uh, regional international agencies, academia, and, and UN colleagues uh, from uh, the resident coordinator offices and country teams. So it's great to have you all. Uh, again, Javier mentioned this is jointly organized uh, between the Intersecretarial Working Group and on Household Surveys and uh, the ECLAC Statistics Division. So allow me to thank uh, the colleagues from the Statistics Division, in particular, Rolando Campo, Javier Mancero, and everyone in the team uh, for the great collaboration on, on this effort. This is actually the second uh, webinar that we organized with ECLAC. We had also three uh, in um, with the Asian region with our colleagues in ESCAP. So it's part of a whole series of, of webinars that uh, where we try to focus on important topics uh, on um, on household surveys uh, from from uh, from the side of the Intersecretary Working Group with close collaboration with the, with our colleagues in the in the regional co uh, commissions. So the small area estimation uh, that integrates household survey data with data from other sources is a really important area of work. Uh, I, I look at this as it helps to improve the granularity of data that we need uh, for to meet the demand for more disaggregated data for the SDGs. So this is certainly a priority. Uh, and now as, as many countries are increasingly focusing uh, their attention on, on the measurement of an estimation of poverty at the sub-national level, I think this webinar is really a, a, a tremendous opportunity to share experiences on how countries have advanced their work, both on the development of the methodologies uh, using uh, small area estimate techniques, but also how, how on, on going from looking at this as a sort of a pilot experimental approach to really being mainstreamed into the regular official data production. Uh, we'll also hear today from uh, important contributions from experts from the academia from, and from regional and international agencies. Uh, this work is, is a priority area uh, for us at UNSD, at the UN Statistics, Statistics Division, as we uh, work and, and, and service the interagency and expert group on SDG indicators, and are also the secretariat and member of uh, the Intersecretarial Working Group on Household Surveys. i just like to mention the inter Interagency and Expert Group on uh, SDG Indicators, which uh, I'm sure everybody knows doesn't need introduction, is the group that has developed the Global Indicator Framework for the SDGs. They have, and they've had over the last few years, a very important war stream on data disaggregation. And, and now they have established a joint uh, work stream on, on small area estimates with the, 
within the Secretary Working Group. So this fits very well and is a very high uh, priority area of work uh, for them. Uh, at the same time, the Intersecretarial Working Group also has focused on small area estimates. That, that group is focusing on, uh, the, the group overall focuses on improving coordination on household surveys and uh, advancing cross-cutting survey methodology. But I would say that increasingly the focus is very much on innovation and on advancing new methods and, and new tools. So again, this is very important. And, and we hope that uh, th this webinar today helps us uh, share and advance, uh, share views and advance the discussion, the conversation around this. I also would like to mention the fact that uh, at, at the statistics division, we are one of the four uh, core entities uh, working on an initiative um, uh, called Data for Now. Uh, and in fact, we have a country here today who is a very uh, important member of that initiative that has worked with us uh, already for, for quite some time. Uh, and, and as part of, um, of the data for now, the focus is on, on strengthening countries' capacity to use new data solutions. Uh, the small area estimates is, is a tool, is an approach that has been uh, uh, looked at. And in particular, we hear from Colombia. Uh, the National Statistical Office of Colombia, Dane, has worked on this. Um, the, we hope that, that through the, the webinar today and the other uh, initiatives the Intersecretary Working Group has been taking, uh, increasingly countries that have joined the data for now and countries that will join uh, and are about to join the data for now will also uh, benefit from this. And, and that's one main principle of the initiative to be able to share experiences and replicate uh, solutions that countries have found successful. Uh, we also have other methodological and, and capacity uh, uh, development work that, that we support. And also through our methodological work, I'd like to mention the toolkit on small area estimation. That is also an important tool that countries might find uh, useful as they advance their work in this area. So I will stop here because I know speakers today have a lot more important and interesting things to say than me. So I just, uh, again, let me thank you everybody. And I very much look forward to hearing from the speakers and, and the feedback and questions we have received uh, from, uh, from our audience today. Thank you very much, Javier, over to you. Thank you very much, Francesca. Uh... Rolando, please go ahead. Floor is yours. Muchas gracias, eh, eh, Javier. Eh, muchas gracias a todos los organizadores de este de este seminario eh, que le llamamos el mapa de pobreza usando estimación de áreas pequeñas. Eh, quisiera dar la, la bienvenida a todos los, los, los asistentes. Ahora ya eh, tenemos eh, 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 aproximadamente ya 219 más los que se vayan incorporando colegas que están participando en este seminario eh, eh, de, eh, a todos los asistentes que están de las oficinas nacionales de estadística organismos gubernamentales en América Latina y el Caribe y de todo el mundo eh, a nombre de la, de la división de, de estadística eh, de la CEPAL eh, saludo a todos mis colegas en particular a a Francesca, a Jonji, a Jaoji, eh, que están colaborando con nosotros dentro de la División de Estadística de Naciones Unidas eh, y quisiera agradecerles por el trabajo conjunto que hemos estado llevando en el tema del Small Area Estimation desde hace ya casi dos años. Quiero saludar también a los presentadores que nos, que nos están eh, eh, apoyando y que amablemente eh, aceptaron la invitación para presentar, hacer algunas presentaciones. En primer lugar, a la subdirectora del Stacking de Jamaica, Lindy Lisha Delate, a Carolina Franco, investigadora principal de la Oficina del Censo de Estados Unidos, a Paul Corral, eh, investigador también del Banco Mundial, a Natalia Arteaga, consultora del Departamento para la Prosperidad Social, y al profesor eh, Parta Lahiri, distinguido investigador a nivel mundial en el tema particular, en Small Area Estimation, quien nos va a presentar las conclusiones de la sesión. Yo quisiera resaltar la, la, la importancia de la medición de la pobreza en estos momentos en que la pandemia está haciendo retroceder los niveles de vida de millones de personas en el mundo y en particular también en América Latina. Como se ha informado, nosotros en la CEPAL 
y es un trabajo que nos corresponde hacer en la división de estadística. Eh, en América Latina y el Caribe se están, eh, se, eh, hay una grave afectación en términos de pobreza. Eh, la pobreza creció de 187 millones que teníamos proyectados en 2019 en la región América Latina y el Caribe, de 187 a 209 en el 2020. Es decir, representa el 33.7% de la población latinoamericana. La CEPAL también proyectó una mayor desigualdad en la distribución del ingreso en todos los países y es muy conocido que eh, esta pandemia pues, ha eh, agravado la distribución del ingreso y la desigualdad en nuestros, en, en nuestros países y en el mundo. En particular, el Gini pues, eh, creció aproximadamente el 3% de, eh, en un solo año. En CEPAL también nos hemos estado tomando, estamos trabajando también eh, en la medición de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible de manera muy seria, abordando el desafío de no dejar a nadie atrás. La pobreza para los países, que pueda, para que los países puedan hacer frente a los retos de superación de pobreza, pobreza extrema y las desigualdades, necesitamos identificar en dónde hay más rezago para enfocar la toma de decisiones de la política pública con equidad. Es necesaria esta información para que los tomadores de decisión puedan incorporar y tomar de una manera más acertada y más, afin, más afinada las decisiones de política pública. La desagregación geográfica es importante para adoptar estas políticas a nivel subnacional. La Agenda 2030 nos llama también a estimar la proporción de la población por debajo de la línea de pobreza, desagregada además por sexo, por grupos de edad, por situación laboral, por etnia, por discapacidad o por nivel escolar, entre otros. Para poder realizar este tipo de estimaciones, pues es necesario acoger la integración de los datos de encuestas, de censos, registros administrativos e información que es facial. Ya muchos países han comenzado a utilizar técnicas de estimación de áreas pequeñas para proporcionar estadísticas oficiales sobre la pobreza. Ya hemos visto, nosotros hemos estado apoyando junto con UFPA, el Banco Mundial, y las demás comisiones regionales de Naciones Unidas y el Grupo de Trabajo Institucional sobre Encuestas de Hogares han establecido ya proyectos de creación de capacidades para apoyar a los países en la estimación de los indicadores de pobreza a nivel desagregado. En la CEPAL nosotros hemos estado coordinando y hemos estado lidiareando la creación de capacidades con los países a través de asistencias técnicas, talleres de capacitación presencial y cursos virtuales. Ya hemos logrado llegar a todos los países de la región con algunas de estas modalidades. Nuestra idea y el, el trabajo que estamos desarrollando es, con la información que estamos teniendo, con las encuestas de hogares, estamos empezando también nosotros a trabajar con mapas de pobreza, incorporando las encuestas que se van teniendo de algunos otros países para poder hacer de, de desagregación en todos los países. Hemos visto ya algunos ejemplos de Colombia, pero también de Perú, pero también hemos estado empezando a trabajar con los datos censales de, de, de México. Es decir, con, con toda una información que se pueda tener para poder apoyar en la toma de decisiones a los países eh, en ese sentido. Entonces, la idea y nuestra oferta y lo que queremos es continuar ofreciendo los, eh, las asistencias técnicas a todos los países que lo soliciten, estamos a sus órdenes de la CEPAL y agradezco mucho de verdad la atención en este, en este seminario porque va hacia el fondo de lo que queremos llegar, cómo hacer una desagregación y cómo medir de una mejor manera en, a nivel subnacional los temas de pobreza, desigualdad, pobreza extrema. Sin más, yo te regreso la palabra, estimado Javier, para continuar con el proceso. Muchas gracias a todos por su presencia y eh, bienvenidos. Adelante. Muchas gracias, Rolando. Uh, and thank you both, Francesca and Rolando, for these opening words. And now I would like to give the floor uh, to our first speaker, uh, Ms. Hawaii Chen. She's the coordinator of the Intersecretariat Working Group on Household Service. And she will share with us the work undertaken in the development of a toolkit for small area estimation. Hawaii, the floor is yours.
We can't hear you, how you? Sorry, can you hear me now? Now we can hear you, yes. Can okay, you put the presentation in the PowerPoint in presentation mode? That's it. How about this? Cool, perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Please go Thank ahead. you so much. Thank you so much, Javier. Um, thank you, everybody, all the uh, people, the experts here. And I am here to present a toolkit that uh, there's a collaborative efforts of the IEC SDGs and the Intersecretary Working Group on Hazard Surveys. Um, and the toolkit is also actually a huge, a larger collaborative efforts by many of the experts here and also many countries. I'll explain that later on. So uh, Francesca already had elaborated a lot about our work. Um, just saying that uh, right now we have uh, our group, Intersecret Working Group Council Surveys, has 11 international agencies and eight countries, and we were established in 2015. So this work is uh, pretty much related to our work on advancing survey methodology is one of our key objectives. Um, yes, also uh, very much related to the work of IEG SDGs and especially on data desegregation. So it's a really um, great effort that we're putting together uh, to help countries. Um, now, so the toolkit, we started working on the toolkit um, towards the end of last year. Uh, when we started, we were trying to see what are the guidance we can give a tool that uh, you know, offer to the countries that they can use it for SDG monitoring, especially for the leaving no one behind mandate uh, for the SDGs. Um, so this was the main objective. And then we also tried to provide as much as uh, practical guidance and country case studies. So we have um, for each of the goals, uh, we're trying to put under examples and uh, national practices and uh, for at least one indicator uh, under each uh, under the relevant goals, SDG goals. But as we work along uh, through the process, we realized there were, there were very little um, uh, case studies we can gather, a lot of more experiments. And so that's why we actually added another objective for this toolkit is that how, uh, since we have been working with the countries and we're gathering a lot of information on what are the key aspects uh, for countries to move from smart estimation experiment to official data protection. Um, and most of the countries in the world has have done some kind of experiments, um, especially focusing on poverty because it has been there for a long time as a key policy area. Um, but when we talk about countries that really use uh, smart estimation esti uh, um, for official policy making for official data production and it's really I would say uh, not so many I mean the percentage is a lot lower we don't have an overall number so we start to focus a lot on uh, what are the en enabling environments how how can we really push countries from experiment and move to official production what does it take um, and for countries to move, to take, to, to move really um, across this uh, experiment to production, uh, how do you call it, barrier. Um, we also uh, started to um, put a space for our partners and countries to really document and disseminate their SMIRE estimation methodologies and, and their work. So the work modality of this group, and so we have a, a large group of experts that um, have experts from academia and also national offices. And then we work off a wiki platform, and this is how the platform looks like. And we've been covering different aspects, and I, I don't know whether you can see it, but we started from, for example, what are the motivations? Why do we need to do smart estimation? And how, what are the key steps of producing smart estimation? And how do we communicate the results uh, with our users and policymakers? Um, and then we have a section uh, on smart estimation country case study by SDG goals. As you said, we weren't able to populate uh, for as much as we want. And uh, um, we, so this is the part on smart SAE smart estimation by SDGs. So. And, and we start with go one, and then we go further. Um, 
we do have, so we, we added, as I mentioned, we added a, a page on actually multiple pages, space to document what we've learned from countries that, um, countries that have successfully implemented smart estimation for their official policy, policy making, and also countries that had challenges uh, in moving towards that. So we actually ask what are the reasons, what are the things you, know, you think would help, uh, how can we help? So we documented all that and then packaged them and then uh, summarized them and put them into uh, this space. So this is currently what we have um, under each uh, heading. We're also adding as we move along in talking to countries. Um, just to give you an example of what we've heard from countries. Uh, when we talk to countries, we ask about their challenges uh, in using smart estimation for um, official uh, data production. And one thing is there's a lack of support from upper management. So there might be a support, the country, the um, upper management might say, yes, you should do it, but then there's no resource to go uh, with it. And there it does, smart estimation does require a lot of resource to, to initiate and also to maintain it, to make sure that it works um, and sustainably. And lack, definitely a lack of technical capacity. And there's uh, there are a lot of modeling and then they also work with the original data, how to uh, transform the data to make sure they work with the model, how to benchmark, how to validate the model. So there is lack of capacity as one of the challenges and lack of proper input data. Uh, we heard a lot from countries that do not have um, a good access to administrative data or do not have a, a strong uh, admin data um, system. And then there's also a little bit of hesitation about you know, uh, using the design-based estimate, which is typically the method we use for household surveys. It's design-based and not so much modeling is involved. But smart estimation requires modeling and there are a lot of assumptions. So there are a lot of hesitation from countries about, can we move that? What if the, uh, the assumptions are violated? And what if we produce a set of estimates next year and it's completely different from this year? Uh, and lastly, how do we communicate all these uncertainties? Um, and when, when, we, when we use in the model, we use for the modeling. So um, in our wiki page that we have uh, provided examples from countries that uh, were successful in getting a lot of support from the countries. Uh, there are legal support. We will hear the, uh, the story from CEPE, CEPE program today um and chile as well and uh, there's a law and then there's a funding to go with it and 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 then there's also example of how to build a team of smart estimation it's not a one-man shop and you have to have a team that really dedicated specifically to to smart estimation and this was the case in indonesia there are just they recently built a team of 15 people um and to work on smart estimation now, input data is a huge uh, challenge I've mentioned, and it's both data access and data quality. So, and the most important thing that's what I heard from countries that have done it successfully, a data quality in countries is actually more important than methods or than modeling. So what if the data aren't so great to work with? Um, we've also covered a lot um, collaboration and what kind of collaboration we'll need to have really a good smart estimation um, program. The researchers, you know, for methods and other government agencies and private sector for data access, and also uh, other data community for data processing, and also within the NSOU, the team, the methodologists, the smart estimation methodologists would need to work with the subject matter experts, for example, to look for a good set of auxiliary variables, and also to work with geospatial experts. Um, a lot discussion on quality and um, how do we ensure the quality of our modeling and the, and the output data. And uh, what's more important uh, pointed out by many countries is external evaluation. It's extremely important, uh, both to validate the data, but also to convince policymakers that it, the, the data, the output and the estimates are reliable and because they're being about, uh, independently evaluated by external experts. Uh, lastly, is uh, capacity building. So we have talked to countries and asked what, uh, how, what's the best way, what's the most, most effective way for them 
uh, to receive help and what what it help it was um what's the modality and oftentimes sometimes you see that there's a, a consultant going and do the whole package for the country and that considered that's considered to be not very effective and so we have documented for some country it worked very well so we document each step and see that's the best way that um the countries can get support from from others um yeah so we have examples and we have quotes from countries and uh we have a lot of uh, reference materials on the wiki page so this is what we have now is still ongoing the work uh the big uh, uh yellow chart is actually a roadmap uh, for Indonesia Statistical Office. They build a roadmap for small air estimation for the next five years. And that's their plan to move on from, um, to cover different uh, indicators and also to move from experiment to production. This is the uh, small air estimation space I've mentioned to document uh, what happened in countries and to highlight important areas and also provide more references. So they are in one place um, and our countries can come and take a look and, and learn from different experiences. Um, most recently, we've added uh, FAQ, frequently asked questions. Uh, we've, we've constantly received questions from our countries asking, how do I deal with this? For example, in the registration form um, for this webinar, I've seen um, one question asked, um, what if my two data sources do not align in terms of the area of demarcation? Um, you have census, you have surveys or survey and admin data and the district level uh, area boundaries are different for, from these two sources. How do I work with their, um, for smart estimation? So we are putting a lot of questions there and we're going to gather um, responses and then put there as well. Uh, lastly, um, so we've we've um, presented our work so uh, in different occasions, and we got an invitation from Pata, and then we presented with uh, within a small group um, of small air estimation experts, and, and we we actually learned a lot from all the experts there. We've been in in carrying out different focus group discussions and meetings and emails with many countries, trying to learn from them. And, and next steps, we, are, uh, we plan to approach more countries and document their challenges and lessons learned and their help uh, the needed from their side. So if you are interested in um, talking to us, please reach out to me. Um, we are going to present a paper during the next SMART estimation conference. Next step, we're trying to finalize the first stage of the toolkit and advocating the usefulness of SMART estimation. Uh, but also with a lot of examples and showing the important aspects that needs to be considered if, uh, for countries, by countries. Uh, we've actually received also suggestions from countries they would like to, us to organize small technical group discussions really to touch on the technical aspects and, and, and pair them with other countries and experts so they, their uh, just questions can get answered. Uh, we've also got a request to, to take a look at the remote sensing. Um, uh, to use remote sensing for smart estimation because of the challenges in access, good uh, quality administrative data. Uh, I do have some questions. I, I mean, I'm not going to ask now, but um, if, if you're interested in talking to me and talking to our group, please reach out to me and then we'll um, uh, work with you and learn from your experiences. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you so much. Javier, over to you. Thank you very much, Hoji. The toolkit is an excellent initiative and it will surely be very useful as a reference material and to guide the, the work on small layer estimation. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, several uh, attendees were asking for the link in the chat, so I don't know if it can be shared also there. Um, Okay, next, uh, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Andres Gutierrez, who is the Regional Advisor on so Social Statistics in ECLAG Statistics Division. And he will talk about poverty map mapping from the perspective of the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. So Andres, you have the floor.
You are muted, Andres. All right. Can you hear me? And, and can, yes, can you now see we might hear you. It is on the screen. Go ahead. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Andres Gutierrez. I am the ECLAC Regional Advisor on Social Statistics. And today I'm going to talk about the ECLAC approach to poverty mapping and how do, do we perform disaggregated statistics using this kind of methodology. In, in particular here in the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, and how they are related to the sustainable uh, development goals. Um, all, of, all of us um, have heard about the 2030 Agenda, and, uh, and if you take a look deeper on the targets and indicators of the SDG, you will find the need for data disaggregation. Uh, for example, uh, if you uh, take a look at the first uh, goal, no poverty, uh, you can say, for example, the, the first target that says by 2030, eradicate extreme poverty for all people everywhere, for all people everywhere. But um, you will find uh, the need for data disaggregation. Uh, for example, um, you, you hear that the second target says reduce at least by half the proportion of men and, and women and children. So, so we can find these subgroups, men, women, and children. That, that means that you have to measure uh, poverty in, uh, in, 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 uh, in some kind of subpopulation that are of interest. Uh, for example, the, the fourth target uh, says that by 2030, you have to ensure that all men and women, in particular the poor and the vulnerable, have equal rights to economic resources as well as access to basic services. Uh, so you have to identify women, men, children, and vulnerable population. Uh, if you take a look at the resolution at, at, at this uh, a global indicator framework, um, you will find that the SDG indicators uh, should be disaggregated where relevant by income, sex, age, race, ethnicity, um, migratory status, uh, disability, and geographic location. And, and of course, here we are in, in, in a poverty mapping seminar. Uh, so when you when you listen the the word mapping and uh, poverty mapping, you in, immediately <laughs> uh, think in in a map and in in disaggregated uh, uh, estimates. But uh, I mean by 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 geographical location, for example. But it is not about uh, everything. is not it, it is not about uh, geographic. So you you have to. Um, to identify these, these targets, uh, these population targets, these subgroups uh, that are uh, not only related with, with the geography. So this is the Leave No One Behind initiative in the 2030 agenda that uh, basically it is related to identifying um, subpopulation and identify how, how are the, the, I mean, identifying and identifying them and uh, measure um, the poverty in those um, specific subgroups. Um, of course, we, we make use of household surveys in order to get uh, national or, or regional estimates, um, specifically poverty estimates. And however, when you try to estimate um, this kind of disaggregation by sex, migratory status, um, ethnicity, race, age, uh, that kind of disaggregation is not supported well by household surveys. So, so when using surveys, uh, we frequently uh, suffer from, from some kind of limitation. And, and we lack precision because of the sample size is not enough to support the, the direct inference. 
Um, as you know, surveys depend on large sample size uh, in order to, to perform well. I mean, large uh, uh, in general. Um, and if you have, uh, for example, a, a good sampling design and a proper estimator that is called a sampling strategy, um, you will find that your inferential system will be exact and precise um, if you have a, a proper sample size. However, when you take a look at the subpopulations, uh, you will find that uh, in many occasions, um, the sampling, uh, the sample size is, is, is not enough. Um, it's not enough in order to obtain proper statistics. Um, so you will need to include uh, external auxiliary information. I mean, there, there, there are two solutions. Uh, the first one is to increase the sample size, but that is not an, an optimal solution because it raises the costs. And I mean, it is unfeasible. Mm, and the other solution is to use um, some kind of novel <laughs> statistical methodologies, uh, like small area estimation and uh, trying to gather information from different so sources. Um, of course, the main source will be the, the, the household survey, um, but you can also include external auxiliary information that may come from censuses or administrative records or satellite images. Um, so that together, surveys and, and external data um, will help to define a proper statistical system um, that will be call, called a uh, small area estimation. Um, and re recall that uh, an area or domain is a small if the sample size is not enough in order to get precise and ex 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 estimates. So the term small does not refer to the absolute size of the domain, uh, but it refers to the, to the sample size of that. Uh, that we could achieve in that particular domain. Uh, so the states, provinces can be considered small areas uh, because of the small sample size, for example. Um, here, we have this key concept that uh, is to borrow strength. And you can, you can borrow strength from, from, the, from areas in the same region, for example, and you can borrow strain from the relationships between the variable of interest with other uh, variables that are measured also in this in, in the survey as well as in the other sources, and you can borrow strain from the spatial relationships and also from temporal relationships. So in general, we we can split. Um, here, the methodologies in, in two types. Uh, here, I mean, here we have direct estimation, um, and as I have just mentioned, um, the sample size is not enough in order to get a proper estimate. So we have to make indirect or model-based estimation. And specifically here in ECLAC, we try to approach the poverty mapping using area level models and unit level models, and of course, a, a setup that we can define as the as a generalized linear mixed model modeling. Um, so let's start with area level models. Here you you can find the the direct estimators. Uh, for example, for poverty. Um, here you have a, a proportion or a rate um, that is estimated via the, 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 the sampling weights. Um, let's think about it, for example, in, 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 in a municipality or, or, or an, on a small domain, um, the sample size is usually not planned in advance uh, because of the sampling scheme follows regularly here in Latin America and the Caribbean at two-stage sampling design. Um, so any estimation or relative indicators, like means and proportions, 
we'll have to use, uh, we'll have made uh, to use this radio type estimator. That means that the, that the numerator and the denominator are random, are random variables. And as you know, <laughs> this is a nonlinear estimator. So uh, in order to, to get the, the estimated variance, we have to use Taylor linearization. And um, that Taylor linearization works well under some conditions. And one of them is to have a proper sample size. Uh, so when the sample size is not large enough, um, none of the above estimators will be precise, neither be consistent. Uh, maybe the bias also is compromised. <laughs> so so the, the regular setup uh, in, in surveys that, uh, that claims that uh, direct estimators are unbiased, precise, exact, uh, uh, and consistent, here in the small, in small area approach, I mean, that doesn't hold anymore. Um, so we have to model <laughs> the direct estimator uh, so that in areas where there is enough sample, uh, the strain will be borrowed from other areas. So here we have the the, the area level, this is the Fay Harriot uh, approach or, or model where you have the uh, this um, link um, with the direct estimator that is uh, here. You can you can see that is uh, um, defined as the uh, um, parameter of interest plus uh, the sampling error. And at the same time, the parameter of interest can be written like a linear relationship between uh, some covariates of uh, auxiliary covariates and um, some uh, random effects. This way, the direct estimator can be written like this and uh, following some base rule, <laughs> following, I mean, after some um, algebra, you can find that uh, the, the um, best linear and bias predictor um, will be given by the expectation of this uh, distribution. And this is the fake area estimator. Um, and we, <laughs> we, we, we really uh, like, I mean, this, this approach. Uh, but we really like the Bayesian approach um, because we, we, we can perform frequent the, 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 the frequencies uh, or class more traditional fake heritage estimation uh, but we were exploring recently the Bayesian way and we really like it so here we have some uh, so, some papers that have uh, helped us in order to achieve the the Bayesian fake area. So this one is from Juan Chapman. And here we have this paper of Liu, uh, Professor Parta and Graham Carlton. And specifically, we like the Ford model approach here in that paper that is called the beta logistic model for, for uh, that, that we, we apply for poverty estimation. And here you have a reparameterization of the beta distribution that um, it's kind of similar to that uh, reparameterization that, that Professor Parta also found some, some years ago um, when defining the, the R scene transformation and the, uh, the R scene of the uh, square root uh, transformation. So, um, in order to perform this Bayesian <laughs> computation, we will we like to use Stan. Stan is a Bayesian software that uh, it, it, I mean it is very very easy to uh, to get uh, Bayesian estimates um, from from area level models using this um, this approach to Stan. Um, but we also perform unit level models. We have studied uh, some, 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 some unit level models from the ELL model to the Molina and Rao model. Um, we finally decided to include, uh, I mean, to use this uh, GMR model uh, because we like to, to include the complex design, the estimation, uh, 
so at the end uh, we we explore this approach and we really we really like it um the approach was first proposed by guadarrama molina and, and professor rao um and it induces a, a pseudo evp pseudo empirical best predictor um that is based on on the nested on the ideas of the um of the evp uh, of molina and rao in 2010. uh here you can find the the, the paper and um very quickly this method assumes that, that we have access to the income um through the survey so we have to to transfer that variable for example using the log shift transformation and at the end uh, the model here you can define this this model this nested error models model and beta will be the vector of regression coefficients and you uh, assume that the um, um, random effects follow a normal distribution with a, a specific uh, variance, and the error of the units uh, follow also a, a random distribution, and, and they are the, the random effects and the error models are considered independent. Um, yeah, so this is the, the nested error model, but um, the GMR approach assumes that you can um, estimate the conditional mean and the conditional variance um, by using the, the sampling weights in this um, in this expression. Let me take a look at the timer. All right, I have three minutes. So at the end, we use the the Monte Carlo estimation um, because of uh, you know the, the the this this conditional expectation is not um, easy to to develop. Uh, so we consider Monte Carlo simulation procedures to estimate poverty indicators, and um, of course we have to to perform a bootstrap uh, approach in order to get um, a mean square errors. Uh, let's take a look at some maps that we have developed. Um, but before that, we have to uh, to to take into account that uh, this um, um, this this methodology is is not only a statistical model, but but it is a mixture of of skills and approach. Uh, so you have to to. To, to take into account the sampling and, and the survey analysis, analysis, you have to take into account the statistical modeling, you have to take into account the optimization steps, and you have to take into account the GIS and the mapping approach. Uh, so here in ECLA, we, we are leading um, this, this, method, this kind of methodologies in the region. And yeah, it is a, a joint effort uh, lead by Rolando and Javier, but also um, Felipe and Diego and all of uh, and all of the college uh, colleagues um, that uh, uh, that are uh, involved in this process. Uh, I mean, they're very important. So here we have Peru. Um, at the left side, you can find the gray areas that are basically uh, areas where the direct estimator does not reach the appropriate. Um, uh, uh, it's not is it, is is not precise basically, and at the right hand you can find the um, the ECLAC approach, uh, the the ECLAC estimates at the province level. Here you have Colombia, and here you have Chile. Chile is a long uh, country in in South America, so we have to split the the country. At the left side you have the North region and uh, at the right hand, you have the, the south region. Uh, but it is not uh, about only geographical disaggregation, as I have mentioned before. Um, we have to take into account other this kind of disaggregation. So this is, uh, these are maps uh, that uh, take into account age and education, for example. Um, here you can find in the first row, uh, basic education, primary, basically. Uh, secondary education and um, university. 
and uh, the columns define the some 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 um, groups of ages. Uh, so here you can find. So here you can find that um, there there is something uh, in, in in the maps. I, I mean, you, you can visualize uh, how 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 the poverty is um, is focusing on on basically some some subgroups. And here you have Mexico, the cross ethnicity and education, and here you have sex and education in order to to take a look at, at, at if there are some gaps. Um, and all right, <laughs> that's it. Do not hesitate to contact us, you know, Rolando, Javier, and me. Thank you so much for, for, for being here in this uh, webinar. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andres, for this overview of the motivation behind smaller estimation and for presenting ECLEC's exploration of methodologies to produce poverty maps for the countries in the region. Um, now I would like to turn to our next speaker, uh, Ms. Carolina Franco. She's the principal researcher and leader of the Small Area Estimation Group at the Center for Statistical Research and Methodology at the US Census Bureau. And she will share with us the experience in poverty mapping at the Census Bureau. Carolina, you have the floor. Can you see my, um, no, you're saying the wrong one. Hang on a second. Uh, I wanna share the screen that has the talk. Okay. Can you see my, uh, my slides? Yes. Okay, good. We, we can see them. You see them, okay. Great. <laughs> well, I don't know what that was. I heard uh, music, okay. So you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm hearing some strange strange sounds on my end, but okay. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk about poverty mapping in the United States. Um, so, um, so, so Andres already covered it all of this. This is my quick slide on small area estimation. So as Andres said, um often you need um things in life do, do you hear do you hear strange sounds yes there is some noise uh, well, this is not open. from this is not from me though this is not coming from me colegas de speak nos pueden ayudar cerrando el micrófono give it a sec It seems to be to be solved now. Please yeah, I don't know. This is not my music, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. Let me. So let me continue then. Um, so basically, um, as Andres said, often we are interested in estimating a lot of quantities in surveys. Um, we cross classify by geography, by demography. So the direct estimators are often not um, precise enough for um, estimating all these quantities. Um, and so the direct estimator are based on the sample data for a domain of interest alone. So that's what I mean by a direct estimator. And typically these are survey weighted estimators. Um, um, so a small area is a domain where the sample size is too small for reliable direct estimation. Um, so the idea for in SAE is to borrow strength. And, and I'll give you some examples of where you borrow strength. Uh, you can, uh, the most traditional perhaps is administrative records. And I point you there to a book chapter that just came out uh, on use of administrative records in small area estimation by my co-authors and I. Um, this actually has an example uh, related to SAPI. Um, another source is censuses. You can use the same survey for a different year or a series of years. Like uh, Andres said, you, you might want to do a temporal warring strength over time, and you can use other surveys. And I also put there an example on uh, poverty specifically. Um, and so you have to be careful, though, when you borrow strengths from surveys, not to use them just as a covariate. You want to account from their sampling error. 
And you have to be more careful if you're trying to borrow strengths from the same survey because it might have dependence with the response which violates model assumptions. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then there's commercial data, satellite data, cell phone data, et cetera. I have personally not worked with those, but I've seen several papers that discuss this. So these are some places where you can look for, for auxiliary information. Uh, now specifically, um, let me address the, up oh, went too far. Let me address the census bureaus. Um, methods. So uh, the, in the Census Bureau, uh, the poverty is produced at uh, several geography levels and age groups by the SAPI program, Small Area Income and Poverty Estimates program. So I want to talk about the poverty definition um, for in the US. Um, so in the US, a family and all people in that family are in poverty if their total income falls below a threshold and the threshold depends on family size and composition. So here you can see how, what the thresholds are for 2020 or where for 2020. So you can see that it depends on the number of children you have and the, the number of people in the household and also uh, people over age 65. So for instance, if you have three people in the household, one child, then you have 20,832, that's the poverty threshold in the United States. So uh, SAPI produces several statistics. I'm gonna focus on related children, uh, school-age children in poverty at the county level. For to, for first, because I've, I've done most of my research on this, this model, and second, um, because I think it's very much of interest here, and third, because I don't have time to cover all of them, but I'll mention a little bit about the state model. Um, so the model is a fake area model, which um, Andres already discussed a little bit. Um, it's an area level model. Um, so it models the direct estimators rather than the unit level data. And the advantage of that is that you don't need covariates from all the units in the population. And in, in, typically you do when you're trying to do a unit level model. And the main data source is the American Community Survey, um, there's also some borrowing information from administrative records and the 2000 census long form. Um, I'll talk about all of that. Um, the American Community Survey is the largest, uh, the largest sample survey and it surveys approximately 3.5 million addresses per year. Uh, it has a myriad of questions and it's a complex survey with stratification and clustering and subsampling of non-respondents. Um, and it produces survey weighted estimates that are either based on one year of data collection or five year of data collection. Um, and it supplant supplanted the long form. And the long form was a survey that was sent along with the decennial to about one sixth of the population um, during the census. So the fake area model was discussed already, but I'll, uh, tell you again for so you can see my notation. So here lowercase yi is the direct survey estimate and capital yi is the truth it's trying to measure. And then ei is the error, the, the sampling error. Um, so we generally assume that the sampling error is normal zero vi uh, and we assume that the sampling variance is known for identifiability Reason. So BI is the sampling variance of the survey direct estimators, but in practice, they need it needs to be um, it needs to be estimated from the microdata. And then UI is the the area I random effect, or also called the model error, and we usually assume it to be ID normal zero sigma square u, and and we assume that EI and UI are independent, and we assume independent across the different areas. Um, so that's the fake area model. Um, and there's a really important property I wanna highlight of the fake area model. Um, so you've seen a formula like this already. So the, the best linear predictor when the parameters are known is this convex combination between the direct estimator and the regression estimator. And the weights, as you can see, depend on the sampling variance and the model error variance. So if you notice, the smallest the sampling variance of a particular direct estimator, the more weight that that will receive in this um, pre predictor. So this is something for those people who are skeptical of models. Well, when you have a very large sample size, um, you, you will have something that's very close to your di direct estimator. 
But when you have a very small sample size, then you will be relying more on the covariate xi uh, in order to do your predictions. So uh, this is a, an important feature, and, and it uh, implies design consistency, provided that uh, your direct estimator is design consistent. Um, so in practice, the variances are not uh, this beta and sigma square b are not known, so you either have to estimate it, say, using maximum likelihood or reno, or you can assign prior distributions for a hierarchical base um, approach. So the county model specifically, uh, the po uh, children in poverty, is, takes the log of the ACS estimates of the number of children in poverty. Um, it estimates the parameters beta and sigma square u via maximum likelihood. Um, and then uh, the prediction results are translated back from the log scale using properties of the log normal distribution. And so the, the covariates that are used, uh, they're all on the log scale and there's also an intercept and this is for each county. So as I said, you, only, you don't need for every unit, but you need, so, but, but these covariates are for the county. Um, so we have a number of poor child exemptions. This is something that you can obtain from our tax forms. Um, so these are child exemptions that, fall, that are in households that fall below the poverty line. Um, so this is uh, SNAP is another uh, administrative record. It's basically a program that provides subsidies for low income and uh, low income um, families. Then the, um, the, the, this estimated um, age 07 population, um, it comes from a program that basically takes the census and then has birth and death and migration and, and, and updates that uh, the population. Then another quantity from the tax forms, number of child tax exemptions. And lastly, the census 2000 estimate of the number of school age children in poverty. And, and, the, and why the 2000? Because of what I told you about the long form, so the last time we sent the long form, um, it was in the year 2000. And since then, um, uh, the, the long forms has been supplanted by the American Community Survey. Uh, so we no longer send the long form. So the census doesn't have these detailed questions that you need to compute this number. So we're using this 2000 estimate, which is the most recent we have. Uh, and I'll talk more about that too. Now I'll briefly talk about the state model. Um, so the state model is also a fake area model, but it's a fake her area model on the poverty rate directly with no log transformation. And in the fake area model, we use a Bayesian implementation. This is a, to avoid having a model a error variance estimate of zero, which can happen with maximum likelihood and gives kind of odd results because then uh, all the predictors are that regression part. And, and so that can, can, can be, can lead to strange results and you're no longer putting weight on the direct estimator. Um, and in the SAP program, the lower geogra geographic levels are ratio adjusted to some to a, the higher levels. So this is for consistency across different levels of geography. So for instance, the school districts, some to the county estimates, uh, et cetera. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the school district estimation methodology. It's actually not using a formal model, and it would take too long to get into it. And I think that the, the, the fake area is something more of interest to this audience. Um, this is a poverty map um, that I've downloaded off of the SAP website, and you can see the different levels of poverty, darker versus uh, darker is higher levels of poverty. But there's a kind of a nicer tool that you can see. Let me see if I can share that. Um, in the other screen, let me see, um, that, um, that you can go and it's interactive. And so you can zoom in and see the poverty for any um, county. And, and you have all these different categories here, age five to 17, and there's this time series as well. So I thought I'd point, to, point out this really nice tool that, um, that allows users to look at different kinds of things. Um, so here is um, an illustration of what kind of reductions you're getting on coefficient of variation. Um, you can see that uh, in blue you have ACS, and these are the median which, within each group. And in the red you have SAPI. 
And you can see that the groups are defined by different populations, categories. So not usually, uh, the, well, the way that ACS samples, the smaller populations will have less sample from ACS. So you see very large benefits on, or reductions in coefficient of variation for the smaller population size categories. And, um, and the threshold in blue, the, the line in blue, um, is where you wouldn't even publish the ACS estimates for those small populations due to poor accuracy and confidentiality. So you can see that you can have huge reductions in coefficient of variations, as well as you being able to publish estimates where you couldn't publish them before. And when the, the larger populations end up having larger sample sizes, so then the, the SAPI estimate will be very similar to the direct estimate, and there you'll see less differences. But you, you can see the huge improvements that we're getting here. So as much as time allows, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about some um, drawbacks, challenges, and current research. Um, and just to clarify that these methods are not currently a part of the official production, but they're stuff that we're investigating. So here are some uh, drawbacks of the model we talked about. So the model made a log transformation on the direct estimators. And um, this implies that you have to drop some, some counties from the estimation because you can't take a log of zero. Um, and in addition, it's very hard to come up with a good estimate of sampling variances um, with a log, with a, with a zero estimate. I mean, the direct estimators uh, of sampling variances are zero and it's not a, a realistic estimator. So some solutions that we've been talking about is to use a generalized variance function, which is basically a simple model on the direct variance estimates. Um, so we've been studying generalized variance functions, and we'd also been looking at modeling race directly rather than log of counts to a drop dropping zeros. And because this is such a short talk, I'll give a lot of references, but I'll only briefly touch upon the research. Another question is, uh, is, could you do better with something that's not normal because the data are inherently discrete? Um, so, one, uh, so we've been looking at other GLMMs, and one in particular we'll hope I'll have time to discuss near the end, the binomial logic normal model. And here are some references about that. And all the references are uh, use SAPI data. Um, another challenge is uh, the long term being discontinued. Now, this may seem very specific to the census, but the problem of covariates going out of date is something that we should always be monitoring in small area estimation programs. So, in our case, of course, it makes sense to borrow strength from uh, past ACS estimates instead because the ACS, um, the ACS supplanted the long form. But um, well, there's a word of warning here that I told you earlier, but if you're using a survey estimates as a covariate, you have to be careful to account for the sampling error um, because it, the covariates have this error. And, and if you ignore that, you can end up with suboptimal predictions and incorrect estimations of mean squared errors. And I have, a, uh, my, my colleagues and I, we have a paper on that uh, in survey methodology so that you can see what happens. So you have to be careful um, when you use survey estimates. You have to do it right. And the way to capture the sampling error can be through bivariate or measurement error models. Um, and in our case, because we have a yearly survey, we can also look at temporal models. And there are some references here. And um, so here is the binomial logit normal model that we are looking as a potential alternative to the current production model. So notice here y is the sample count, and i is the sample size, and pi is the true proportion. Um, so y i given pi and i is binomial, and, and then this pi gets a logic transformation because it's a proportion, and then you have the regression function and the model error. So potentially, this may be appropriate, uh, more appropriate for discrete data. It naturally handles zero estimates and skewness. And here I didn't say anything about the complex sampling design, but you can um, adjust this by using the effective sample size in place of the sample size here. So you can make, try to incorporate the complex sampling um, into this. 
And by the way, it is often important to, to do so, to, to incorporate the complex sampling. So that's something to think about when you're doing small area estimation. And this model can be readily extended to bivariate and temporal models. So for instance, we, we looked at AR1, AR5, et cetera. Um, so here we have um, a little comparison between the bivariate BLN and the bivariate here borrows strengths from the previous non-overlapping five-year ACS estimates and, and administrative records covariate. So the five-year estimates, if you recall, are based on pooled data for five years of data estimation. So this is a bivariate model. And this comparison here basically aggregates uh, the two different models by state and compares them to the direct estimator. So these are the percentage differences. The idea is that if you have a very large sample size, then you think that the direct estimates are accurate and most states do have a very large sample sizes. So you can think of the direct estimators as being very accurate at high levels of aggregation. So in that sense, it's good that if you aggregate that your model should be close to the direct estimators because at that point they are are reliable. So this is just one measure and I don't have time to cover many of them, but notice that the blue ones tend to be closer here to the line that says per, the 0% difference between uh, to, with the direct estimators and the red dots here, um, they are the production model. Um, so in our case, um, there, with, using a bivariate model is not the only way to borrow information from the past uh, because we have this survey that happens every year. So we compare doing that to uh, special uh, versions of the BLN that we extended to be temporal. So we, expanded, ex we extended this BLN model, which is a model that's been used before to be um, AR1, AR5, um, and we compare that to the bivariate models that borrows from the pooled data, since this is a, a product that we produce in, in the census, this pool five-year estimates. Sorry um, to interrupt, Carolina. You have yeah. one more minute, please. Okay, so I'm almost done, actually. So we found that the performance of the two were similar, perhaps slightly better for bivariate models. Um, but uh, one thing to keep in mind for time series models is the facility estimate year to year changes. And so, so you can see our paper for more on this. But um, so I wanted to give you a little taste of the program and a little taste of the research. Um, so SAP is a great example of a successful small area estimation program that has been in place for many years. So by leveraging other data sources, SAP is able to provide improved estimates that borrow strength. And you saw that it can also produce estimates where where we were, able, we were not able to release uh, direct estimates due to lack of accuracy and privacy. Um, so I have places here and someone, they can look at the, you can look at the slides later. You can see the SAPI website. Here's a book chapter on SAPI. And I put all the references of the papers I discussed in the end of the slides. So thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina for your clear presentation on the different data sources and the model used uh, for small area estimation in the Census Bureau, and also the ongoing research topics. And also I would like to highlight a point you made very briefly, but is the importance of using interactive visualization tools to make the results accessible, such as the one you showed. Um, our next speaker is Ms. Natalia Arteaga. She's the statistician, a statistical advisor for the Department of Social Prosperity of Colombia. And she will talk about the recent experience in poverty mapping in Colombia. Please, Natalia, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning, Javier. Uh, thank you for your the invitation to share our experience with you about the poverty map in Colombia. Uh, I am going to share my slides, one moment. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, now they are in, in presentation mode. Okay. 
Um, okay, um, bueno, currently I am working in the cash transfer management in the Department for Social Prosperity in Colombia. Uh, the Department for Social Prosperity is a public entity, entity with the mission of implementing strategies and politics to reduce the multidimensional and monetary poverty. Uh, in the case of the cash transfer management, it ensures or five national programs of cash conditional and unconditional transfers. Even uh, the current government created two new programs during of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, called uh, Devolución del IVA and Ingreso Solidario. Uh, for that reason, it is very important for my entity to have a monetary poverty map for municipalities because it's a strategic tool for defining the target the coverage and budget for these programs. Um, in Colombia, uh, we made a monetary poverty map for 2018 and 2019. Uh, nowadays, we are defining the data to update the map because during the 2020, the household survey had many changes in some months due to quarantine. Okay, in this presentation, I am going to explain deeper by following this order. Uh, first, I am going to talk about the context and source of information. Uh, later, uh, later, I am going to talk about the, what is the utility of poverty maps using a small area estimation, and what is the model applied to the poverty map in Colombia. Um, later, the results of the monetary and extreme poverty map in 2019. Uh, Additional, uh, we made comparis uh, we made uh, uh, two comparison with current coverage to cash conditional transfer program in a specific case for families in action. And finally, some applications on future work uh, in social prosperity. Okay, first about the context and source of information. Uh, in Colombia, uh, we have an entity to measure uh, official statistics uh, such a, as poverty. Uh, that entity is, the, is called DANE. DANE is a Spanish acronym uh, that is a stand for National Administrative Department of Statistics. It's similar to the National Institute of Statistics in other countries. Uh, DANE is in charge of providing official information on poverty and living conditions in Colombia. Uh, in Colombia, we measure two kinds of poverty, multidimensional and monetary. And each poverty has a different source of information for the measure. Uh, in the case for the multi multidimensional poverty, uh, the DANE use the quality of life survey uh, and the census for municipalities reports. Uh, while, while for monetary and extreme poverty, the DANE use integrate household survey. This survey is the biggest survey in Colombia with around two, uh, 230,000 households in the sample. Uh, in the case of the poverty map, we use uh, two principal source of information, uh, the integrated household survey and the census. Uh, as I have said before, the integrated so, uh, household survey uh, allow have information for some variables, poverty, occupation, inequality for Gini coefficient, uh, per capita income, and so and so. Um, this survey uh, has um, 438 selected municipalities. In Colombia, uh, have 1,122 uh, municipalities, so near to 700 municipalities don't have sample. Also, uh, this survey allows different levels of disaggregation as national, urban and rural area, uh, 13 metropolitan, metropolitan areas and 24 states. Uh, in the case of the census, uh, the census has a uh, coverage in all municipalities of the country and it allowed to report the multidimensionality poverty at municipalities level. However, it's not possible to do so for monetary poverty case 
signs more variables in the questionnaire are needed. Uh, the census has a decennial update, and the last update was in the 2018. Uh, in this slide, uh, we uh, we are show the the power, the monetary poverty incidence in Colombia. The first uh, the first graph is about the monetary poverty incidence in Colombia. And the Colombia particular scenario was 35.7% um, uh, incidence for 2019. This graph shows the um, disaggregation levels for the estimation national and urban area, rural area, uh, 13 main series, and other um, urban uh, zones. In the second graph, uh, we have the extreme poverty incidence that in, in 2019 was 9.6 percent for Colombia. But this graph has the same disaggregation of the previous case: national, urban, rural, etc. Uh, for 2019, Colombia had a change in the methodology for poverty estimation. The changes were related to new definition of the basic food basket, new Shansky coefficients, uh, and new poverty lines and disaggregation for the poverty lines. Uh, so the key point in this slide are the disaggregation levels for the poverty estimation using the household survey because it, it's a challenge for social prosperity because it's harder to define public uh, political and strategics without detailed information. On the other hand, in Colombia, there are uh, different gaps, for example, the poverty in an urban or rural areas. So each area has a particular behavior. This slide shows the multidimensional poverty map made with the variables in the census. But as I have mentioned previously, the multidimensional poverty is not a no because there are various programs or policies uh, that have goals or objectives related to household income and not to the privations of life, only, uh, life conditions. Uh, also in this slide, we mentioned the, the five cash transfer programs in, in my country. Uh, the programs are Familias en Acción, Jóvenes en Acción, Colombia Mayor, Ingreso Solidario y Devolución del IVA. Okay, um, the following section is the utility of COVID poverty maps using a small area estimation. Uh, we have uh, two questions about the, the poverty maps. Excuse me. The first question is, what it, what it is important to build a poverty map? So a poverty map is a monetary poverty estimation at a lower level or geographical disaggregation. In our case, it's the municipal level. This will be a public policy, public policy instrument that we allow to first comprehend in a deeper way the poverty of the country. Second, generate a crucial change in the dialogue uh, on poverty, including motivation for new strategies and approaches. Uh, there is provide the guidelines to structure the operational details or, of a specific programs and the re redistribution of resources. And last, create the concern and interest in evidence-based policy making. And the second question is, what is the products or results could be obtained from a poverty map? Uh, we have a, a, a list with uh, some results. Uh, for example, is the definition of poverty lines. Um, because the poverty map defines different behaviors for geographical sums. And additional other, other result is prioritization of assistance our areas define zones with higher monetary poverty incidence, as well as the ones with higher geographical correlation to minimize the cost and maximize the efficiency of the programs. 
uh, also analysis of public spending and coverage of social programs, geographical targeting, uh, for example, estimation of inclusion and exclusion errors in the targeting. Uh, it's important to define the zones with big gaps in attention for priorities in the next stage uh, in the programs. And also correlation between uh, poverty incidents and cash trans and the cash transfer programs coverage. About the model applied to poverty map in Colombia. So this slide is, is a, a, a abstract about the small area estimation. Um, small area estimation models explain the variation in the area beyond what auxiliary variables include in the model could explain. And there are two approaches to smaller estimations, uh, area level models and unit level models. In the case for prosperity, the social prosperity, we use the unit level models uh, with the unit level is a uh, household. About the methodology uh, in, we, uh, in Colombia, we had the advisory of ECLAC for the construction of the poverty map. Uh, we check different models and we define the empirical budget method based on, based on a nested iron model proposed by Molina and Rao in 2010 uh, as the best option for our case. The, the advantage of the model are uh, the data is analyzed at a unit level in all specific cases, households. Uh, the households contain detailed information about the social and economic conditions of the municipalities. Uh, additional, the model allows to estimate the poverty indicators in function of an objective variable. In our case, the per capita income, um, for example, uh, we, we made two indicators as monetary poverty, extreme poverty, Gini coefficient, poverty, poverty gaps, and so. Um, and finally, the, or not finally, for in, in that case, for finally, the model allows uh, to estimate other areas or domains difference for municipalities with the restriction of the variability measurement social coefficient of variation. For example, other domains uh, is uh, people with disability, regions, uh, gender, migratory status, etc. Um, in, in this slide, uh, we show uh, abstract about the uh, steep for the made the poverty map. Uh, in the first in the first step, um, we analyze the of available variables within the source of information, the census and the household survey. And we search the match between the variables in the two source of information. Besides, we made the iterations in the model for defining the best combinations of variables for the per capita income estimation. In the second step, uh, we create the indicators and define the covariables, covariates in order to predict household per capita income. In this step, we check the best format for the variables. Um, example, in the case the um, continuous variables with the layers, we prefer to use categories for these variables. Or for example, um, in the case of the categorical variables with many categories, uh, we group the categories with few observations. In the third step, uh, the per capita income model prediction, we implemented the mixed effort, effort model. Um, we define the sample model with the survey data, and fixed effects for municipalities, and some urban and rural. And the objective variable was the per capita income and input variables related with uh, life conditions. Uh, in the first step, um, we, uh, we applied the Monte Carlo for the per capita income estimation. 
and bootstrap for the Monte Carlo simulations for errors. And in the last step, uh, we apply it a benchmark and geographic, uh, and geographic validity. Uh, this step allows to have the same estimations for the domains in the integrate household survey and reduce possible skewness. Uh, other other um, details about the model. Um, okay, the, as I have mentioned previously, the model was defined as the per capita income in function of like condition variables. Uh, these conditional variables as the number of members in the household, labor maker, education, health, housing conditions, and so on. The objective variable is the logarithm of per capita income plus a custom of a 123,618 pesos. This constant minimizes the Fisher coefficients of skewness for the model errors. The data set, the household survey in 2018 and 2019 has some zeros in the per capita income. Uh, we didn't make transformation to this variable. The fixed effects were defined by municipalities and urban uh, or and rural area in the survey, in the household survey. For each model, 2018 and 2019, we use the poverty line according to the official methodology for each year as presented by Danny. If you remember, Danny defined new poverty lines and by seafood basket for the monetary poverty measurement in 2019. Okay, uh, about the, the results of the, the poverty map results 2019, um that is this is the map the old poverty map for 2019 in colombia um in the uh, in this map you can see the zones with more monetary poverty incidence in red and located in the pacific um, and for example in the pacific region which one of the more vulnerable areas in colombia contain uh, the Choco state, uh, the majority color is red. And also areas in the map with red is the Caribbean region with Guajira states, and some areas on some zones in Amazon region. For behavior previous, we know that these zones are very poor in Colombia. So that is a, this is a constant result. Um, the, uh, the, 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 poverty, the monetary poverty incidence total for this map is 35.7%. Uh, it's, it's, it's equal to the, to the incidence published for DANE uh, because we applied the, the benchmark in different levels for this map, uh, national, urban, uh, main cities and states. Uh, other analysis took place. Uh, we checked the results with other, other variables correlated with monetary poverty as roads. Uh, the first map is roads, the second map is energy, and the third map is light density. We found that the zones with more roads, more energy, more uh, light density, shows less uh, poverty. This is a conscious uh, result. Um, it's, it's, it's a green sums in that case, green sums in that case, and green sums in that case. In the case of extreme poverty map, we found the same behavior uh, of the monetary poverty map. However, we have uh, 35 municipalities without estimation because these municipalities have a coefficient of variation greater than 30%. Uh, that was the criterion for defining the quality and published estimations. 
um, the, the extreme poverty incidence of uh, 9.6% is same to the official statistics in Colombia because we apply it the page. Sorry, Natalia, you have one minute left, please. Okay. Okay, uh, that is the, the same map for the extreme poverty. And that section is the uses and applications of poverty maps in Prosperidad Social. Uh, we made the exercise of comparison between extreme, um, between the families and action coverage in the phase three, in the phase three with the monetary poverty uh, incidents. Uh, we found a correlation of 70% between these variables. Uh, so actually in Colombia, we are in the recertification of the household in familias and opción. So it's a useful result for the new targeting for the program. Uh, we define the 10 municipalities with a, a coverage greater than the poor household and the top 10 for the municipalities with a coverage lowest than the poor household. Uh, because that is a, a resource for the targeting of the uh, Familias en Acción in the phase four. Uh, other applications uh, for we will make in future work is is the poverty map uh, as input for a G system that allows analyze variables related to poverty, as well as generate conclusions about the cause of poverty in the country. An additional, uh, the poverty map is an input for targeting the territor territorial strategies to overcome uh, poverty. For example, uh, PEDET, PEDET is a strategic in, in Colombia and about the municipalities of armed conflict, uh, Caribbean or Pacific region, a uh, priority in the national development plan. And finally, the priority map is an input for definition of territorial coverage uh, of transfer program in Colombia. Ma, in conclusion, um, but the methodology used by Prosperidad Social is based on the unit models. Uh, we have the advisory of the ECLAC, and the estimated model allows the production of the data disaggregation to other no geographical domains uh, as the, the uh, people with disability, okay? And finally, the poverty map allows defining strategies and coverage for cash transfer programs according to the number of poor households in each municipality. And this increase in part of reduced uh, poverty in my country. Okay, I'm finished. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalia, for this presentation on the Colombian experience with poverty mapping and also for raising the issue of the potential usefulness of these methodologies for public policy, such as geographical targeting or identification of cash transfer beneficiaries. Um, our next speaker is Ms. Lisha de la Tipa there, Deputy Director General of the Statistical Institute of Jamaica. She will present the experience of the Statistical Institute in creating poverty maps for Jamaica. Lisha, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, or good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you right. All right, thank you so much. So today, as Xavier just mentioned, I'll be presenting some information on the Jamaican experience using poverty maps that were generated using small area estimation techniques. So in terms of using the use of poverty maps in Jamaica, we have been using poverty maps since 1992. Um, our second set of poverty maps were created in 2002 and the third set in 2012. So we tend to do them near a census. For the first um, set of poverty maps that we used, we looked at the unsatisfied basic needs approach. And in the second report, we used both the UBN approach and the consumption approach. And we compared data using the, the, the 2001 census. And for the third one, only the consumption approach was used. 
and I'll talk a little bit more about the third. My emphasis of the presentation will be on the third in the series of poverty maps created for Jamaica. So to put it very basically, what is, what is poverty mapping? It is a method to estimate the welfare level and the degree of inequality at lower aggregation levels, such as EDs for us or communities. Um, it uses a model of household expenditure from a survey data set to estimate household welfare and apply it to a census data set, which does not include household expenditure or income information. And poverty indicators at the community level um, are then estimated as aggregates. So in terms of the approach that we use for 2012, we started with uh, stakeholder workshops. And these stakeholder workshops included persons from various stakeholder groups. And what we did in these workshops were to define what the model parameters were. So some of the discussions we had was, for example, defining the geographic areas for each model, um, defining what kinds of variables are reasonably comparable between both the census and the survey data. And we also got um, feedback from key stakeholders on particular aspects of the, the information that they require for their policy and program implementation. We, so after doing those stakeholder workshops, we then went on to the phase of modeling, and this was primarily done by the statistics office with significant support from the World Bank, um, and specifically um, their consultant, Eduardo Ortiz. And the final um, phase in the approach was after we came up with the model, we had another workshop to validate the results of the survey. In terms of the team, for the poverty mapping, it included methodologists, it included survey statisticians, policy specialists, GIS professionals, um, program managers in, in various government departments and agencies, and other key stakeholders, including academia. In terms of the stages of poverty mapping for us, there were three stages. In stage one, what we did was we looked at the data sets for both the census and the survey to try and identify the level of compatibility between both data sets. And only the variables with the same definitions and distributions were allowed to be used in the second stage or the modeling stage. In stage two, what we did was to run a series of regressions um, to, to try and estimate expenditure and to decompose random unexplained components. And once a believable welfare estimation model was obtained, then we applied that model to the third stage, which, which was the simulation stage. In stage three, what we did was we used the model parameters that we had agreed upon and defined in stage two, and we performed repeated draws on different random components to bootstrap household expenditure. And the, the estimated household welfare was then aggregated at different levels. Also in this stage, we had some level of model evaluation, even after estimation. So for the, in terms of software that we used, we looked at, um, we primarily used the World Bank's PogMap tool. Also we used Stata and we used ArcGIS um, for the creation of the final maps. And of course, I said earlier, we did get technical support from the World Bank. And it should be noted, I know the next presenter will speak more about it, that the approach that we used then was based on um, the approach recommended by Elbers, Lanjou, and Lanjou. And I hope I pronounced the names correctly. In terms of our comparison, we looked at, for the 2012 poverty map estimates, we looked at the census for 2011 and also the Jamaica Survey of Living Conditions. The Jamaica Survey of Living Conditions is a LSMS type survey. And for 2012, that had representativeness at the parish level. Generally, the SLC is representative at the regional level only, but, in, but every five years we have what we call a large sample SLC that is designed to give us reliable estimates at the parish level for the 14 parishes of Jamaica. And the census, of course, was 
pr providing data at the ED level. So that's a very the enumeration district level. And the enumeration districts are on average um, 100 households in rural areas and 150 households in urban areas. The poverty maps that we ended up with gave us reliable estimates at both the parish level and at the community level. And we had defined 767 communities for the purposes of the poverty maps. In terms of our comparison, we, the first thing that we did was to one, identify the variables that were collected in both the census and the JSLC. And then what we did was to assess um, the averages, the design adjusted confidence interval. So we did account for the complex sample design. So in identifying the variables, it was both variables that were co collected directly, such as the sex of the head of household, and also derived variables like the dependency ratio or the number of children in a household. And in terms of our assessment of the um, equality of the variables between both the census and the survey of living conditions, we look, we had an alpha of 0 0.5 or 5%. And we looked to see whether or not the variables were statistically equal with a 95% at the 95% confidence interval. So for the JSLC for 2012, we had 6,579 households and around 20,500 individuals. And some of the variables that we looked at for the, that is collected in the, in the JSLC include demographics, education, consumption, and housing characteristics. For the census, we have about 881,000 households and 2.7 million people in Jamaica as a census 2011. And those are the general categories of variables that were collected in our 2011 census. So you can see that there is some level of overlap in terms of the information that is captured in both surveys. In terms of stage two, determining the consumption models, we had to define geographic regions that we believed to have a similar consumption patterns. And in total, we agreed upon, based on all of the discussions we had with all of our stakeholders, we agreed upon seven geographical groupings and we created the models at that level. So we took out, for example, the, Pari the capital of Jamaica, which would be Kingston and St. Andrew. And we also took out, for example, the resort areas and we grouped them together and other urban centers. So those were some of the groupings that we um, used. In terms of determining the variables to include in each model, we also looked whether or not there was significant linear correlation with consumptions using the Pearson's correlation coefficient. So conceptually, a total of 77 identical variables, including derived variables, were identified at the household level. And these variables were tested for each of the seven geographic groups for equality. In terms of some of the variables that we looked at, like I said, they relate to household size, um, household composition, age, sex, occupation, education, materials of dwelling, access to basic services, and household assets. Now, what we did was for, for the 77 variables in each of the seven groups, if the estimate from the population and housing census fell within the confidence interval of the respective mean value of the JSLC at the 95% level of confidence, then that variable was allowed to move forward in terms of inputting it into the model and then um, determining whether or not it was a significant predictor. We also had some control variables, a total of 46 of them, and these were aggregated at the level of the parish and the community, and they were included in the modeling stage. And the purpose of these control variables were to control for differences between communities in terms of their population, climate, housing characteristics, public transfers, and public services. And the sources of the control variables were both the population and housing census and also administrative records and other data sources. 
in terms of the modeling stage, now for each of the seven groups, we use the general least squares regression approach and we use a log linear model um, to try and estimate the level of household consumption. There was also an error term that was added to the model, which represented both um, the error term that is common for all households in the same geographic unit and also the error term that was specific to each household. So for example, in the model, the X, data, the X set of variables related to household characteristics and the Z set of variables related to um, characteristics of the geographical unit. For the error term, the error term also can be further decomposed and includes, as I said before, the error term, the error that is common to all households in the same geographical unit and the error that is specific to each household. All right, so the objective of the modeling process was to analyze the power of each model to predict consumption based on two conditions. One, that all the variables in the, included in the model were statistically significant, and two, that the adjusted coefficient of determination, or the R-square, was around 50, was around 0 0.05 or no less than um, 0 0.30. So, and this is consistent with empirical regularity for these sorts of models in terms of poverty mapping. So in terms of the simulation stage, there are about 200 simulations that were done um, for the, the, the models that we used. And the imputed consumption was then compared with the survey results. In terms of model evaluation, each model was evaluated in terms of the magnitude of the estimation error that is common to all households living in the same geographical unit. And this assessment calculates the ratio of the variance of that error relative to the total variance of errors and indicates what proportion of the variance of errors is due to the unexplained differences at the community level. And as that ratio moved away from zero, of course, you know, the reliability of those estimates decrease and it reduces, as it reduces the accuracy of capturing the fact that the households living in the same community are more similar among each other than their peers living in other communities. And we set as a threshold that this ratio should be less than 10%. And for all of our seven modeling groups, this was achieved. So this is a summary of the model results. You can see the definition of the seven groups. Of course, as I said, the, the capital of Jamaica, Kingston, um, and its surrounding environments in terms of the suburban communities that are in immediate proximity to Kingston parish capitals, other, rural, other urban areas, um, rural areas were also disaggregated because what we found was that there is difference in certain rural areas. And you can see that we all achieved our squares that were higher than 0.3 um, and also our ratio of variance was all less than 10%. You can see for each model of the 77 variables, the amount that remained in, the mod in, in each one of the models. In terms of the comparison between the imputation and the JSLT figures, it should be noted that when we imputed the consumption onto the census data, there were three variables that we estimated. One was per capita consumption, two was total poverty, and three was food poverty. And we also looked at the confidence interval of these estimates and the CVs for predicted consumption and the standard errors of poverty estimates at the community level in evaluating the utility of these estimators at the community level. There were, of course, some communities that fell outside of the established thresholds, but the overwhelming majority of these indicators, in fact, I'm seeing 95% of the communities fell within the acceptable thresholds. So this is a graphical representation of the imputed values in the solid red line and the dotted line represents the confidence intervals based on the survey estimates. Again, a, a tabular um, presentation of the estimated values. You can see here, for example, we have one parish 
um, St. Elizabeth that had estimates that were outside of the acceptable levels. In terms of total poverty, again, the mapping of the imputed values and the confidence intervals, and we are showing which parishes were in versus out. Um, for the food poverty, again, um, the imputed values vis-a-vis -vis the confidence intervals and the tabular representation, all were within acceptable um, levels. So this now on the screen, and I'm wrapping up shortly, is the poverty maps um, graphically, well, spatially represented for both 2002 and for 2012. And what we saw when we did, because as I said, we have done poverty maps repeatedly, is that there wasn't a significant shift in the level of poverty, even though between the years there had been fluctuations. But between these two points in time, the level the level of poverty was um, statistically equal. Um, however, what we saw was a shift in the distribution of poverty. So in 2002, you will see that a lot of the poverty was concentrated in the central part of the country, um, whereas by 2012, along the resort areas, which are along the north coast of Jamaica, you see where poverty had significantly um, gone down. So what's next um, in terms of poverty maps? We do intend to um, do another round of poverty mapping in Jamaica following the 2022 population and housing census and the 2023 Jamaica survey of living conditions. Um, this is something that we are very, we find very useful. We know our policymakers from the Planning Institute of Jamaica. Um, they are our partners in the publication of of these poverty mapping estimates and also other stakeholders we have buy in at the highest levels. So this is something that we do have on our work program as the Statistical Institute of Jamaica um, following the population and housing census. Um, I do concur with one of the earlier presenters who, in, who indicated that this is not a one man um, activity. You, it requires a team of experts and it does require some technical expertise. Um, between the last poverty maps that we did and now we've had some staff turnover. So of course, there will al there's always a need for capacity building. And of course, there's been new developments and new papers. Um, I was very intrigued by Andreas's presentation earlier about some of the new uh, and emerging approaches to using small area estimation. But it is something that we are definitely looking into and we are interested in implementing it and developing other maps um, to try and provide data at more disaggregated levels. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Lisha. It, it was a very illustrative presentation on the different steps and the different decisions that you have to make to use a unit level model, in, in this case, to build a poverty map for Jamaica. Um, if there are questions or comments from attendees, uh, you can please write them in the, in the chat. Um, now, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Paul Corral, Senior Economist of the Poverty and Equity Global Practice at the World Bank, uh, who will share with us the innovations in small area estimation from two recent papers. Please, Paul, go ahead. Thank you, Javier. Uh, can you see my, my screen? Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, now it is showing up. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Corral. I'm a senior economist at the World Bank's Poverty and Equity Global Practice. Today, I'll be presenting some of the work we've been doing and the updates we've made to our approaches to poverty mapping. Uh, the presentation is based on work I've done with numerous colleagues within the bank, as well as uh, Isabel Molina. And the presentation is based on work from the following paper. So it's, it, these papers are, are, are background information to poverty mapping guidelines we'll be publishing in the near future. Uh, and I, I mean the very near future, I just sent the draft to management yesterday, no? So uh, the first pr paper present, represents a major update to the methods and toolkit used at the bank for small area estimation. It presents in detail the previous procedures used and how these are updated. Additionally, it illustrates the improvements obtained from the update using the model-based model simulations. 
Uh, the second paper is more recent and conducts a rigorous model and design-based validation of different methods. Uh, and the paper uses the Mexican Intracensal Survey from 2015 as a census data set of roughly 3.9 million households from where we draw 500 samples to conduct design-based validation. Uh, so first I'll present the updates to the methods and toolkit we use. I will present the problem and why we needed an update to the, to the PubMap software that, uh, that uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Delaita Budeir present, presented. I will then present um, uh, how these, uh, these new methods imp improve upon what we have been doing recently. Uh, and it draws from, the paper from our paper titled Pull Your Small Area Estimates Up by the Bootstraps. Then I will present some of the results from a validation of various methods we did in the Mexican survey. Uh, this coming from, from the second paper, uh, a map of the poor or a poor map. Uh, and I can share with you the links for these afterwards. Uh, so as, as you may know, um, small area estimation at the World Bank until recently was based on the methods from Elbers, Landyao, and Landyao, who we kindly call ELL. Uh, and, uh, and it was the de facto methodology we used when conducting poverty maps uh, at the World Bank. And although there was an EB implementation in 2014 uh, and an empirical best implementation, it was still heavily linked to ELL's methods. And I'll show you why afterwards. So PubMap originally was coded in C and it was a super efficient software which allowed us to load census data from the, for the simulations, even in the most computationally deprived scenarios. Now the software, uh, however, had drawbacks. It was somewhat of a black box, and because of its point and click interface, it wasn't easy to work with for simulation type of work we needed to validate methods. It also made it very difficult for other colleagues within the institution to contribute to the project, since C isn't a popular uh, program among bank staff. In 2016, myself and other colleagues in the, in the bank, including one of the original author, including the original author of PolMap, Chinua Zhao, uh, made a Stata version of PolMap, which allowed us to expand the, the small area estimation work program. And so once we had the, our, 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 our Stata code available, uh, we replicated simulations that Molina and Rao 2010 presented. And it became immediately apparent that the methods we were using were not best. Uh, so sometime after finalizing it, uh, we, we noticed this. And when we did this, it was very clear that something wasn't working properly, right? On the figure on the left, we can notice that the implemented EB approach uh, in PovMap was yielding upward biased estimates. Then on the figure on the right, you can see that ELL and PovMap EB implementation yielded noisier estimates than direct estimates, which completely defeats, defeats the purpose of small area estimation. Now, granted, these... These are simulations, they're based on the model's assumptions and they're based on, on rather large sample data from the areas that are rather small census. So the population is like 20,000. You can read about it in the paper, uh, in the papers, but so this, this brought concern to us, no? something needed to be fixed. Additionally, uh, it allowed us to test the variance measure of, uh, used in the past in PubMap and in the original Stata SAE package, right? Uh, and so despite the method yielding a higher noise estimate than the parametric bootstrap from Gonzalez, Mantega and, and colleagues, the approach used to estimate the method's noise actually yielded an underestimate of the method's noise. So it, beca it became quite clear that we could be doing better. No, you can see here the X's, they all are under the true uh, mean squared error for these, for these estimates, right? And so, this shouldn't be the case because the assumed model is the same in ELL and Molina and Rao. And so one thing that lingered in my mind was what Isabel and, and, and Professor Rao mentioned in their paper is that the assumed underlying model for, for both methods is the same, right? And so an important aspect to consider here is the assumption of normality of the error terms. Uh, and this will come into play a little bit later. Uh, and the difference between ELL and, Molina's, and Molina and Rao's EB is clear. Uh, but with the EB implementation from Bandervide, the difference wasn't clear why it was coming through. There shouldn't have been a difference. And so at this point, I shared with Isabel Molina uh, some of the stuff I had been working on. 
and asked her if she could join join uh, my work and our work and, and come in as an advisor in the production of the poverty mapping guidelines, as well as the updates to our toolkit for poverty mapping. Now, the problem of the original ELL seemed to be uh, based on the, on the bootstrap methods used. In the original ELL, the, the authors offered a couple of approaches toward obtaining an estimate of the noise. The method used in PolMap relied on multiple imputation methods, which aren't necessarily aligned to the goals of MSC, uh, to the goals of uh, SAE, sorry. And so under the methods implemented, the parameters used to simulate welfare onto the census population are drawn from their approximate distributions. But note that in the simulated welfare vectors, we never use the actual parameters from the model estimated with survey data. From the simulated vectors of welfare, roughly 100 for a given area, the mean across population is taken as the point estimate and the variance is used as the noise estimate. Notice that under ELL, there is an assumed approximate distribution for the random location effects. However, this is not available in van der Weide's method, right? And when I say the assumed approximate distribution for the random location effects, I mean this, this sigma eta here that you have here at the bottom. I hope you can see me like scribbling there. And so for the EV implementation in PodMap, something similar was attempted. Instead of drawing parameters from their approximate distribution, bootstrap samples of clusters in the data are taken to keep a similar algorithm to the one used in ELL. Although there are numerous problems here, perhaps the most important one is that under a given bootstrap sample, it is possible for an area to be included or to not be included. Thus in one sample, the area may benefit from EB and in other it might not. However, the fitting method offered some advantages which we wanted to keep. It allows for sampling weights and heteroskedasticity. And so we wanted to keep that, right? Uh, and so this led to the revision of the EV methods we used. And I'm really sorry for putting all of this math in here. Ignore it. You can read about it in the paper. What really matters here is this, this the fact that the error, the, this is the big difference here where I have the red arrow. That is the big difference to ELL, you no? Know? Uh, and so the Monte Carlo uh, approach towards obtaining point estimate follows closely the methods from Molina and Rao. The, the difference is, what we, is that we do not link households between the survey and the census as done under EB. However, in software applications, this is done by appending the survey observations for a given area to the census population of the area. Because this is not done here, we refer to it as the census EB, which Molina and others had proposed in the past. The bootstrap method follows the, ones, the one from Gonzalez Mantega and colleagues, which is the same one as the one used by Molina and Rao, and you can get more details about that in the paper. Also here I highlight right, the benefit of EB. The random location effects in ELL are drawn from a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation sigma eta. However, here we condition on the observed sample mean for the area and thus make much more efficient use of the precious data we have at hand, right? So all in all, EB should always be preferred to ELL. Now the mean squared error estimate from the revised approach is aligned to the empirical MSC, as you can see here, the, the, the gray axis follow closely those red triangles. Additionally, the bias is near zero for all areas and the empirical MSC is much lower. Look at the bias of the, of the H3 census B. It is near zero for every single area and thus the true MSC of the method is much smaller than that of the ELL and the previous EB implementation. Moreover, because a correct application of census EB conditions on the survey sample, it makes efficient use of the information at hand. It represents no loss when compared to ELL An area sampled the area sampled in the survey will benefit from EB and all, all others will approximate ELL. So overall, we're now doing a pretty good job. This method now is fully implemented into the Stata SAE package. I can share links with you afterwards. They're also at the beginning of the, of the presentation. Uh, and, and it's now the recommended approach for, for a small area estimation conducted by the bank. Now, another interesting aspect is that the mean, the census EB approximates EB's uh, noise 
as the sample shares by the areas uh, by areas as they decrease. No? And this is something that Molina had noticed. Um, and so the figure shows the difference in mean squared error between EB and census EB under a 20 and a 4% sampling fraction right by area. Note that this is considerably larger than the sampling fractions most surveys we work with. Uh, and what we can see here is that under the 4% sampling fraction, the difference in, in the mean squared error of the EB and census EB is nearly zero, right? Uh, and this is what you want, okay? So overall, the updates were quite good. Uh, they accomplished what we were after. Now, how does this perform with real data? Uh, and this, is what, this, is, this comes directly uh, from our paper, uh, a map of the poor or a poor map. Uh, and so when we presented some of the initial results of what I just showed you, many colleagues and others questioned the results because they weren't obtained under real world data. However, the results are obtained under the exact model's assumptions. And if something doesn't work well here, it's unlikely it'll work elsewhere, right? So you, if it follows the model's assumptions, it should work there. But under real world data, there are mo many moving parts which will not be the same across every data set. And thus what works in one scenario may not work in another. And so ensuring that you are aligned to the model's assumptions is crucial, right? Here I describe a little bit how we created the Mexican Intracensal Survey, uh, and, and which is a large data set carried out by Inegi, uh, which is representative at the municipal level. It has a sample of roughly 5.9 million households. One of the most important aspects of the survey though, is that it has an income measure, which we exploit for this. After cleaning the data, we end up with a census of roughly 3.9 million households split over 1,865 municipalities and 16,297 PSUs. From the census, we draw 500 samples, right? Following a similar sampling approach to the one used in LSMS surveys. The new samples are representative at the state level and have a sample size of roughly 23,500 households. Using these samples, we test the following methods along with a few others, which I won't discuss here, but you can also see them in the paper. Uh, census EB with one fold nested error model uh, with the random location effect specified at the municipality level and a different specification where the random location effect is specified at the PSU level. Census EB with twofold nested error model from Maruenda et al. Uh, 2017, which has now been implemented into the status, into the STATA SAE package, with the random location effect specified at the municipality level and a different specification where the random location is effect is specified at the PSU level and the and the municipality level, right? Uh, so basically, you can take into account the twofold nested error uh, model, which accounts for the two two stage sampling. And finally, ELO with one fold nested error model with the random location effect specified at the PSU level. Uh, we also tested other methods, as I mentioned, but they're not relevant to, to what I'll present today. Uh, and so one of the first things that became very clear for us is the importance of data transformation. And this is something that wasn't uh, necessarily available before in PovMap. Uh, and so you want to make the transformation so that the model's assumptions are met. And this is extremely uh, important. A correct transformation not only yields less biased estimates, as you can see in the figure here at the bottom left, but also yields less noisy estimates, as you can see in the figure in the bottom right, uh, right, where you see the, the, the empirical MSC and the bias, meaning that they are the aggregation of the 500 estimates obtained using the 500 samples. Uh, so this is nothing new, as many others have already shown this, but it's still different when you observe it on your own, right? Uh, it's like when, when, you, when they serve you a plate of food and they say, be careful, it's hot, yet you still have to try it to see if it's hot, right? Uh, so under two-stage sampling and the sample sizes and sample sizes like those observed in real world scenarios, both, most methods we, we tested appear to perform better than direct estimates in, in terms of mean squared error. Now, this is, this is quite good. Uh, the results are empirical, thus in the sense that we present bias and mean squared error for all areas. And for each area, we have 500 point estimates, each point estimate obtained from the 500 samples uh, drawn from our census, right? Uh, notice how the direct estimates show very little bias, yet have the largest mean squared error. Uh, this is in essence what we try to do with small area estimation. We sacrifice a little bit of bias 
to achieve gains in the mean squared error, although there is a limit towards how much bias you're willing to accept, uh, which also becomes an issue. Adding contextual level variables, uh, meaning uh, area means, for example, uh, or PSU means, yields improved estimates, not only with less bias, but also with less noise. So you can compare here the census EB no context uh, versus the census moon EB moon, and you can see that the difference is quite considerable in mean squared errors. Uh, notice also how ELL, the ELL PSU is, is even less noisier. So ELL with the random location effect specified at the PSU is less noisy than the census EB without context level variables. So inclusion of the context level variables, area means and stuff like that, is very useful for, for modeling. No? Uh, and under ELL applications, it's not uncommon that the random location effect is specified at a level be below the one at which results are reported. And so according to Maruenda uh, and colleagues in 20, from their 2017 paper, this may actually lead to a loss of, of efficiency. And we can see this here, specifying the random location effect at the PSU level and aggregating to the municipality level yields noisier estimates. You can compare here the top two uh, results, census EB moon and census EB PSU. Okay, in the absence of a twofold nested error model, uh, specifying the random location effect at the reporting level, level represents virtually no loss of efficiency. And this is what you can see here comparing the twofold nested error model census EB here uh, and the one up top. So they're virtually the same, right? And so we don't need to fret about the, the fact that we don't have the twofold nested error models available in software, although now it is available in the Stata SIA package. And so for off census years, which is, which is something that we have been quite uh, recently drilled, right? Uh, new methods could be an alternative for off census years, but more research on this is needed. Uh, multiple times, uh, colleagues have come to us to ask, what can we do? Can we do a poverty map? We have a survey from 2015 and our census was conducted in 2010. And usually you don't want to do that because the, the, the moments of the distribution are not gonna match and it's always gonna be difficult. And so what your, what your options are either to do a Fay Harriet model or, or something else, right? Uh, and so most of us have seen these poverty maps done with machine learning and satellite imagery data. Uh, these are poverty maps, but thus far, I haven't seen any proper validation. And most authors usually sell their methods by showing correlations between their estimates and direct estimates. Uh, and most, most of them actually focus on, on an asset index. So using the same Mexico data, we try to see how an application of gradient boosting performs. Notice that here we model poverty headcount rates at the PSU level and use census aggregates as covariates. Uh, notice that I could, in theory, replace the covariates with satellite data and perhaps sacrifice model fit or also use covariates from an older census. Now, what we observe is that the gradient boosting methods do hold promise and may be quite good. So look at here where, when I model, when my model is done at the municipality level versus when it's done at the PSU level and aggregated to the municipality level. Those mean squared errors, empirical mean squared errors, are quite similar to those of the census EB. This is, and, and very little bias. Huh? This is quite good. Uh, and so we're, we're devoting a bit of time to do, to do research on this uh, because there is a lot of, uh, of inquiry regarding the ability to do poverty maps or uh, small area estimates in off census years. Uh, so some concluding remarks. I'm overall very happy with the updates we've implemented. Uh, the census EB updates work much better than the previous methods in all the tested scenarios. However, computationally, computationally these are somewhat more demanding. Uh, the updated bootstrap methods are properly estimated in the mean squared error, unlike the previous MI-inspired methods used in POVMAP. Uh, the twofold models may be appropriate for two-stage sampling, but in the absence of software or for simplicity, area effects may be enough. Uh, we do not recommend specifying effects at lower levels and then aggregating. Uh, I think this, this leads to noisier point estimates. Uh, and once the guidelines are completed, uh, these will hope, once the poverty mapping guidelines I mentioned at the beginning are completed, 
These will hopefully serve to guide different teams within the World Bank who are assisting, uh, providing technical assistance toward conducting small air estimation. Uh, and finally, uh, a good portion of future efforts uh, will focus on poverty maps for off census years, which is in high demand, yet still in its infancy. No? And, and in the paper, the, the, a map of the poor or a poor map, we evaluate a method that was proposed by some colleagues in the, in the World Bank, and, and we find it that it's, it's, it's lacking. It's not perfect. It yields biased estimates. So there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul. You have showed us very clearly how the methodologies we use for small area estimation have room for improvement and how the World Bank has implemented such, such improvements. Um, so thank you again. Our final speaker today is Professor Partha Lahiri. He's the director of the joint program in survey methodology uh, of the University of Maryland. He has worked, uh, worked extensively on survey statistics, big data, Bayesian statistics, record linkage, and small area estimation. And he's joining us today to share his views on poverty mapping. So Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to discuss uh, the six papers. The papers are excellent and I enjoyed all the presentations. Um, well, um, I received most of the paper in last couple of days. The last one arrived this morning, uh, but I tried to capture some of the um, features of these papers, but it is possible I may have missed uh, some of the important points. So I apologize in advance if I miss something about your paper. Uh, first of all, what is poverty mapping? It's a mapping of the poverty estimates. Uh, it could be a different uh, poverty indicator. Uh, poverty rate is widely used. So a lot of times it's the map of poverty rates. But what is mapped? Uh, the question is uh, how to map this thing, what kind of estimate we should use to generate such map? That's the question. And that is the topic we are discussing today. Um, it came out in a number of these talks that uh, the direct survey weighted estimates are unreliable. Uh, first of all, the sample size is small. And so if you use uh, poverty maps using direct estimate, it could be very misleading. So that's one thing. And in Andrew's talk, uh, he also mentioned that it's not j just the point estimates. Uh, you'll have problem in estimating standard error. You know? So, the question is uh, what to do about it. Well, uh, one option that most of the presenter talk about to consider improvement of the estimates, uh, basically by borrowing strength from different alternative databases. And most of the time it could be administrative data or census data and uh, then try to uh, improve in terms of mean square error or MAC. So the way I would organize uh, this uh, discussion is that I will first uh, discuss Hawaii's paper. This is quite general uh, um, topic. She described on how to go from experimentation to uh, put things in official production. So that's very important. And then I'll go to different papers um, and I, I'll offer my comments. Okay, so the first is uh, the paper that how I presented today. Um, it's uh, good to find out that interagency an expert group on sustainable development goal uh, agenda on data dis disaggregation 
uh, it is very encouraging and it should help different countries in developing SAE system for uh, in the future. And the paper uh, touches on different important components of implementation of SAE in a national statistical system. Uh, there are a lot in that paper and I obviously don't have time uh, to discuss all of them in details. And so uh, what I'll do, I'll elaborate a little bit on three components of how I mentioned. Now, one component she mentioned is the communication and that is very, very important. So the national statistical system, they generally use household surveys to produce all their estimates, the survey weighted estimate, uh, usually at the national level or some big area level. So why suddenly we have to switch the methodology and that has to be communicated very clearly. So, um, uh, so the, I would like to give you some graph uh, that I used in uh, a project that I did with uh, Chilean poverty mapping uh, with our former JPSM student, Carolina Casas Cordero and uh, Chilean government employee, Jenny Encina. Uh, so uh, in the graph, what you see here, I say plot times this plot of direct survey weighted estimates for some Chilean communa, it's like municipality. One of them is large, uh, Santiago, large in the sense you have a lot of sample. And that is the uh, black one here from 2006 to 2013. And the, all the other three, the red, blue, and green, are small communas. And the reason uh, I suggested to draw this kind of graph is to communicate to the public policymakers, in this case, I think the mayor of these counties, that it is a good idea to switch to some kind of small area model-based method. And uh, if you show this graph, uh, to the data user, they will immediately see that the direct estimate, these are all direct estimate, uh, they are pretty good, stable across time for uh, Santiago where you have a lot of sample, but very unstable, very erratic over time. So for example, if we look at the, um, the green one, uh, it comes down, comes down and then goes up. And then the blue one, it comes down and goes up and then comes down again. And uh, so at the time uh, they were considering this mapping, uh, the mayors of these municipalities was concerned uh, because uh, say if, if you are in a blue graph in 2011 year, it's quite high poverty, but it goes down uh, to next, uh, next year in 2013. So when you are here, uh, you might be worrying that uh, poverty is very high. And uh, if you use another method, which will bring this number down, you might lose some funds and so on. But uh, what is important here to have some kind of stability across time, so you can have a solid uh, policy making. Here is a graph of the uh, direct confidence interval of direct methods. And on the right hand side, you have small communa and you can see the length of the uh, intervals is quite large. And so it may, may not give you a lot of uh, information when you have large length confidence interval. So it is, uh, better to develop some technique which will reduce the length of the confidence interval. And here is something from a uh, SAPI project that Carolina uh, talked about. And this is a plot, time to this plot of graphs of official estimate, which is the model-based estimate based on EB method, empirical-based 
method. And the, uh, the green one is direct estimates. So you can immediately see there are some issues like in 2007 year, this is from American Community Survey. Uh, there is nothing for 2007 uh, because there is no data uh, for this year for the domain they're interested in. They're interested in child poverty. And uh, uh, in comparison, if you use EB model-based method, you can always get something. And uh, the problem is there with uh, standard error estimates too. And in general, the model-based method, which is the official method, is giving lower uh, standard error. So let me uh, talk about how I's uh, paper now. He talked about, uh, let's see. Um, she talks about uh, different components, as I said. Sorry about that. Um, so I'd like to uh, now uh, talk about collaboration and capacity building. So the expert panel idea is, uh, is a great idea. It's good to have people of different discipline coming together to solve a problem of interest. You know? And one can help each other from their diverse knowledge. So that's a definitely a get great idea. Uh, and then I think it would be good to develop a different mechanism that allow collaboration between government researcher and researcher in academia and uh, survey organization. And here in the United States, we have such program. For example, uh, there is a program called uh, American uh, Statistical Association, Census Bureau, and sometimes Bureau of Labor Statistics, USDA, uh, they have a program where uh, faculty from different university can come to different agency and work with uh, their employees to um, on different research project and small area estimation could be one of them. And uh, I did some of that in different agency, I really enjoyed it. And I got a lot of, uh, out of it uh, for my own research. So this is definitely a good idea. And we can uh, encourage government researchers to participate in webinars. There are lots of them these days. Um, short courses offered by different universities and different conferences, workshop, et cetera. They're a really great idea. And then international agency like United Nation uh, and uh, and developed countries may help organizing training sessions. And I'm familiar with some of them. And one I did uh, in Japan, it's a training program on SDG as disaggregated level by UNCAP in 2019, where they brought uh, people from 20 different countries to train uh, in smaller estimation, not just in poverty, but lots of other SDG uh, indicators. And more recently, I did something uh, SSC for Western Baltic countries, and that is organized by Statistics Sweden. In fact, there was one uh, in Chile organized by UNDP, and uh, that was very useful, uh, not only for capacity building, but they use this knowledge to put things in official production. Okay, so now uh, the paper by Carolina Casas Cordero, no, sorry, Carolina Franco of Census Bureau. Uh, here, uh, different area level models used uh, for county and state levels. Uh, area level means that you model uh, the survey statistics. And uh, this is a follow-up of the landmark paper by Faye and Harriet, we used to, uh, you know, area level model to produce small area estimate for per capita income for small places. In the production uh, of this uh, program, a frequentist method is used to implement the county models while a Bayesian method is used for state level. County estimates are raked to the state estimates and state estimates are raked to the national direct estimates. So we have some kind of data consistency, and it could probably bring some robustness into the procedure. 
direct estimate of sampling variances are, are used in area level models. So these are some of the features that I can capture. Um, I have some uh, comments. You'll always have some comments and I have some here. Uh, why frequentist method for the county level estimation and uh, Bayesian uh, method for state level estimation? That's one question I have. Uh, and what is the prospect of unit level modeling for poverty rate estimation, especially when I see number of projects that, that was discussed today use uh, unit level modeling. And Carolina uh, gave some reason for that, that it is difficult to get you know, good auxiliary data at unit level, uh, not just in the sample unit, but for all the units uh, of the finite population. That's kind of challenging task. And I actually had some experience in this with the USDA data. They, they have very good uh, sampling frame uh, where they have a lot of uh, good auxiliary information, but sometimes it creates problems. You have missing data, you have outlier, you have measurement error. And, and so these are the things that one has to be careful about when dealing with uh, unit level uh, problem. But other than that, uh, do you anticipate uh, any issue with modeling complex survey data? You know, um, And then what is the prospect of using a joint model for survey weighted estimate and sampling uh, variance estimate uh, in order to smooth the sampling variances as well as to account for additional uncertainty? Because that's one of the criticism against uh, uh, area level model. And in this respect, uh, one can think along the line of Liu, Larry, and Carlton paper that uh, Andres uh, mentioned today, but there are other papers in this line. Um, now, Chilean poverty. You're muted, Professor Parker. Thank you. Uh, Chilean poverty mapping. Um, is basically area level model, but they had uh, different uh, checks in, in the process. For example, something called Windsorization, you know, uh, and then benchmarking in place and parametric bootstrap implemented to produce a confidence interval. Now let me uh, talk about, uh, discuss Paul Correll paper. Uh, he talked about unit level modeling with parametric bootstrap in the STATA SE package. I would like to congratulate him uh, to put uh, parametric bootstrap uh, in this package. That should be very useful for data analyst. Uh, I noticed that parametric bootstrap uh, was used without bias correction. And uh, uh, those of us who are in the university spent a lot of time in thinking about this bias correction. Uh, but I think such a method generally works fine if the number of areas to be pulled is large. You know, uh, There is no need for bias correction. But then uh, uh, if the number of areas is very large, that uh, may uh, pose another new issue, which is associated with the violation of exchangeability assumption of the proposed model. For example, uh, right now in the nest air model, we assume all the uh, slopes are the same, right? And so that may be violated if you have a lot of small areas. So they are, uh, that comment I received from Carl Morris uh, in, in discussing my paper with my friend Yun Jiang in 2006 test paper. And recently I have written one paper with Nicola Salvati uh, addressing this thing, you know, uh, when one can use uh, parametric bootstrap without bias correction and uh, to go for some uh, flexibility in model uh, modeling approach uh, that might allow this kind of bootstrap without bias correction. Now, as for a historical note, I would like to say uh, that it, the parametric bootstrap was first proposed in the SA context by a paper by uh, Laird and Lewis, very nice paper, poly, uh, mimicking basically, basically hyperparameter uh, Bayesian calculation. And in the empirical best prediction context, 
it was first developed by my student, uh, Buta, in 1997 uh, dissertation, and later we published a paper in 2003. Uh, the research uh, uses survey data, uh, but survey weights are not used, I noticed. Uh, there are a number of papers available now in the literature that addresses inclusion of survey weights in SAE, model-based methods, starting with my paper with uh, Aurora and Prasad and Rao, U Rao, Paferman, Savarskop, Wad Dramala, et, et cetera, uh, that somebody mentioned today. So uh, this might be the next step, I guess, and you may be already considering this, uh, noting that Isabel is one of your collaborators. Uh, I, uh, although, you know, I like very much EB method or AB method, but I would like to give some credit to ELN method, which is basically synthetic method. It's a, it's a more robust modeling, doesn't need a normality assumption. It can handle uh, zero sample size, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so I wonder the parametric bootstrap, uh, when you use normality, whether it will do uh, well when the ELN method uh, use a completely different types of modeling. It, in fact, they also use variance modeling, very complicated method. So this is something one can explore in the future, I think. Now, regarding essay in op census here, that's an important topic. There is a paper by Masaki et al. That showed the correlation between the estimates and the census, not just the direct method. So that is something to look at. And they explained their method gave promising result. And there is a more recent paper by World Bank employee uh, Newhouse. You know, and now Coral et al. mentioned in one of the paper that uh, he showed uh, omitted variable bias, which he didn't discuss today in the application of unit context model, where you don't use the unit level covariate, but area level covariate. But I don't think this is a major issue and can be rectified if one uses the estimator of regression coefficient proposed by Jiang and Lahiri discussion paper or UN Rao. Now the paper uh, presented by Lisha uh, Dilati Boder. I like the idea of getting different stakeholders in both model building and validation. Results. This is very important to get uh, ideas from different people. And unit level modeling uh, was used and uh, it again used uh, ignored survey weights and possibly other design information if I can understand the method correctly. Uh, it would be instructive to compare uh, your results with EB using area level models. Um, model uh, use includes a large number of auxiliary variables. Uh, does this reduce, reduce the predictive power of the model? Some other model selection methods like BIC could be used. Survey weights and other design features could influence model selection. So there is a lot more things one can possibly do here. As for evaluation, you're checking if the proposed estimates fall inside the corresponding direct confidence intervals. If they do not, it may, it may not necessarily mean that the proposed method is unreasonable. There are other evaluation uh, measures you could perhaps consider like examining benchmarking ratio. I'm saying that because sometimes uh, you might say it, uh, get uh, the estimate zero and standard error zero by direct method because of very small area. And so if you consider the confidence interval, basically it's a point, right? So obviously any reasonable method that you propose will not, may not cover this thing. Okay, then the paper by uh, Natalia Ortega is again unit level model. Uh, the method is flexible in the sense it can produce poverty estimates for different domains of interest, very, very good. And design features such as survey weights are not again incorporated in the methodology. And uh, how do you propose estimate for non-census here? These are the, some of the question I have. Finally, this morning I got the paper by Andreas and while listening, I jotted down some points. Uh, different small uh, groups are of interest. They may not be good geographical area. This is a very important point because we don't want to leave anyone behind. It could be demographic groups, for example. Small in terms of sample size of the area, uh, the area-wise it may be large, but it is the sample size. 
that creates a small area problem. A uh, problem with both point estimation and uh, standard error, if you use direct method uh, that I noted earlier, we have talked about two options. One is increasing sample size, but there is a famous quotation. Uh, the client will always require more than is specified at the design stage by when fuller. So whatever you do, we have to go for some kind of sophisticated SAE model, modeling approach. Uh, it's good to uh, find out that uh, they're considering Bayesian methods. They were using STAN uh, is used for computation, but there are other software available like INLA, ADM methods, so you can look at it, they're much faster. Uh, now, suitable choice of prior could make Bayesian closer to the frequency. So those of you who don't like the word Bayesian, you have some comfort. I have a paper with my student, Masayo Hirasi in JASA, where we showed that if you choose your prior uh, carefully, the method could be, uh, uh, the Bayesian method could be very much like the frequent test, you know, and uh, posterior variance would be very similar to the uh, parametric bootstrap without uh, the bias correction. And it also provides a better estimates of the shrinkage factor. Uh, survey weights are incorporated in the SAE methodology. That's a good feature that I noted. Now, uh, now we are uh, in an age where everybody is talking about big data. And so question is what to do about it. Should we ignore it? That's the question, but I found a quotation here. It says, uh, DJ Finney once wrote about the statistician whose client comes in and says, here is my mountain of trash, find the gems that lie therein. Finney's advice was not to throw him out of the office, but to attempt to find out what he considered gems. After all, if the trained statistician does not help, he will find someone who will. In fact, I, can, I already see some papers developing. In fact, I recently used some big data from Facebook uh, in, uh, in doing another small area problem, which is vaccine hesitancy. And so there are some hope there. So we should consider in a big data. And the question is how to develop methodology. That's the real challenge. Now here I find a quotation. This is a famous quotation by George Box. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And here is my opinion. All SAE models are wrong, but some could be useful in supporting public policy making if appropriate statistical inference procedure are used. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for your excellent comments and for touching on the many different aspects raised by the earlier presentations. We have reached the end of the webinar somewhat later than, than planned. So we appreciate that most of our audience has stayed connected until the end. Um, I would like to thank again our speakers for the excellent presentations. All of them raised issues of relevance to the use of small area estimation. And I'm sure that these presentations will be useful material reference for the work of our different institutions and, and research. Um, also, a special thank you to the interpreters, because the presentations with formulas and statistical terms always bring a special challenge for translation. So we appreciate a lot the excellent work done. A big thank you to Heoye, Andres, and the teams in UNSD and ECLAC that made this webinar possible. And thank you all for participating. We hope to see you in the next event. So good day to everyone. <laughs>